I'm going to talk about a framework that I've been developing over the past couple of years, at least when I have the free time to develop it. I've been the sole developer on this project uh, since it started, and it's kind of my contribution to the open source community. I'm very passionate about the open source development and believe that it is the right to everybody to be able to have this knowledge and share that knowledge because knowledge is the freedom of man. And we want to get that out there. And if I can get something out there that inspires someone else younger or someone new coming into this field that they can go from or they can take it a new direction just by sparking a new idea, that's my goal. And that's why I love to produce some off-sex software in the open source community and what gives me my passion for continuing our involvement in, in InfoSec. Um, you can find me in all of these channels listed. I run Hack All the Things on Freenode. It's a, a very basic IRC channel based for pen testers. There's a lot of really good guys there, and there's a lot of new people there. And our involvement is we didn't want a, or really didn't want to have an IRC channel that was based solely on a project because there's all the ones we see are project based, set, metasploit, you know, beef, whatever. They have an IRC channel for hacking, and it's based on that project. While we will support N4P and Pen2 as things are developed from Pen2, and I like to work within that community and help develop for Pen2. You know, we just wanted to leave it open and help out, but you can always get any information you have. Don't feel free, like, oh, I, maybe I don't know enough to be there. You do. We want everyone new and just to enjoy the experience of this community and be able to get with the right people in the community right away. Um, the GitHub is where you can follow my live builds until they get pushed down, until I release a new copy, a stable or unstable, and it gets pushed into the Pen2 repo. So you can watch live builds. And anything that's going on talking about is in my blog at WordPress. A lot of it's talking about what we're doing with N4P and where it's going. Uh, but now that N4P, the SDLC, I feel in this project is really starting to come together at a sound, sound position. So we're going to actually start doing a lot more training and tutorials on that blog so you can catch some you know, great attacks and new attack vectors that you can utilize not just with N4P but in pen testing. So my vision through my development cycle has been how do I fill voids or things that I miss? They're almost solely based on while I'm on engagement pen testing, what do I see is wrong? What's taking me too long? How can we create a scenario that we can perform our job more efficiently and effectively and produce a better product for our clients or whoever we work for at that, at that time? The second portion is I like to be a functional developer. By, by that way, I make that software functional but how do I fill a void? If I see a void in the industry, we want to fill that void. And I did not see anything within Info InfoSec right now that, co that covered the layers and the attack vectors that we are going to do inside a framework structure. That's why NFRP started to be created or evolved to what it was. Um, this thing can... So as far as that handles and thinking about it, like there was nothing in the wireless space and there was nothing in the low level space. Like we have Metasploit and that really covers everything on the ISO level from like five to seven. That doesn't get us down our infrastructure level. And we have set covering our social engineering and we have grown to really rely and depend and like these tools because they hold everything together into a nice package framework for us to search, build from, and it allows the community to contribute with new ideas and mo modules based on their research and proof of concepts. So that was actually a goal design that I had in this project. It's gone a lot further into becoming a full-blown framework and be because of that, the community can get involved now and create modules of their own design and use them through this framework. Why my mouse wasn't working. So the original proof of concept was far beyond wireless. When I decided to come up with the proof of concept for this project, it was based on uh, sales exchange vulnerabilities, PO POCs of sales exchange vulnerabilities. I wanted to see what I could do with a lot of point of sale services and circumvent the security that's in, pl in place by PCI because I don't really feel like that's a, an effective model. It's pretty broken. And they're trying to secure things at each endpoint. So it was designed to make man and middle attacks by utilizing the infrastructure hardware on our systems, creating, uh, bringing up a switch, and then just stealing lines at a, a POS terminal. And then we can control in the firewall settings what packets were allowed in and out. That way we can be completely incognito on the system, gather packets forward by never changing any MAC addresses, 
and then adjust ours on a different interface. Nate will clone their MAC addresses, and then we can do packet injection through Scapy after we've modified what's in. A scenario for that might be if you went to a point of service terminal and sniffed what's going on, and you put enough packets together to figure out how tickets were printed, the table numbers, the food, into what printer. You could just you know you could just push that. You can sometimes you can uh, flood the printer with NCAT. You uh, NCAT flood that, or you can use Scapy and change that packet and send it over. And basically, what would happen is a receipt would print in the kitchen with a with a table number, and it go on the go on the service on the line, and someone would deliver it to your table, and there would be no track record to pay for. So you've exfiltrated free food. If you're ever hungry, you can do this. Or Go further than that and think about, well, can we assign any information back to the data, to the database back in? A lot of places use like QuickBooks. Is that information secure coming across the wire? If, if it's not, it's going to be using SSL. More than likely, we can run SSL strip right from where we're at because that tag vector is built in. The firewall controls for controlling the port forwarding are also built in. So now we could maybe even think about injecting us a paycheck through their QuickBooks, it goes through payroll properly. It would take a lot of investigation and get down to it. So these are some more ex exploit vectors and attack structures that aren't thought about within the PCI model and shows why the information is broken in, in ways that we can have fun exploiting it that we couldn't exploit based on saying application processes through Metasploit because we wouldn't have that. So I started this project and this is pretty much my theory how it went. I start writing this code. I automate process. This is exfiltrate all kinds of great stuff and have a lot of extra free time at work to go snowboarding because, hey, it's all automated now. The bottom is what really actually happened during this project. A lot of bugs. And then it became an ongoing development. I've yet to go snowboarding or find any free time. But it's okay because when I started this, I saw that the, the potential would more likely make me feel like I could add some more leetness to my name and my handle, and I could kind of look like Boris and think I was completely invincible and everything. I promise you guys there's no cat pictures in this slide, so don't worry. The reality of what started happening after that was, oh crap, cat picture. Rick, did you put cat pictures in my slide? hackers. So I ended up having 99 little bugs in my code and I got rid of some. Then I had 127 so the past two days we've been on the con completely just writing code and I think I've really got it at a great place now we can have some, some real fun with it. The reason the bugs happened was most likely I was watching Swordfish and you can understand why the bugs got interjected and, and the exfiltration process. Now let's try to understand why this framework is so much different. What we're going to be looking at is on our OSI model of how N4P controls our system state. We're going to be operating mainly between layers one through five, but more often two through five. So we're not really concerned about the application, the presentation uh, layers or, or layer seven and six, which is where most of the frameworks rely on for exploitation, for web exploitations and general data exploitations through Metasploit. That, that's its main concern. So we're creating a framework that is designed in an entire different OSI level that we're not seeing yet in the industry. So if we can get this to keep going and taking off, it opens up a whole new level of attack vectors and thought processes that companies can use internally for internal penetration teams or for a lot of vulnerability research processes. This is great because while we're controlling network level adapters, the software is also dictating how the firewall configurations are based between the structures and attacks that we need for different OSI based attacks or the OSI levels that we're going to participate in that attack. It also allows you to control like SSL strip and editor cap and you can adjust the options based on the configurations for whatever type of work and reconnaissance you're doing and if it's going to be very incognito or not. But because of what we had laid out because this is the main concept as I was creating the POC. 
I really found that this was very vulnerability research and niche. It was difficult and it's very hard to constantly manage your states, bridging the adapters, which N4P does. It will bridge everything for you. It can call a VPN that you have predefined and pull the things to the VPN and then route it through the firewalls all automatically as well. So the, the process of us remembering all the commands of everything all the time and then typing it up, bringing it down, changing the interface, bringing it back up, setting the IPs and the routes is very daunting. So we wanted to cover that for us and get that done. Now I looked at it, what can we do from here? What is also really awesome that we can deliver and fun and that, can also, that could get people interested in, in using these products? And the answer was wireless. Wireless is based initially on these layers, one through five, and controlling um, the access points, spoofing them in the MAC addresses, and how we're going to capture packets and crack them. So I was like, okay, let's start implementing it. And we slowly started implementing it. First started with WPA2. Well, we got some extras. And uh, why don't we take a look at what type of attack vectors you could expect that is built into this framework already from the start. Based on the lower level of the OSI models that we're going to do, we have packet capturing injections. We can circumvent SSL. Now that we are ran in the middling most of the, these situations, we can control our DNS servers locally. We can spoof DNS, we can redirect people. And through that, that means, hey, I can spin up a coffee shop AP and I can run in my own DNS server and, and forge Facebook or make, when they go to Facebook, come to my 127 because I'm running a Apache local service. I can even get a self signed cert, like a third party CA cert, so that you don't get as many error messages or you know people think that it's more secure. There's a whole lot there in that realm that we can control and have fun. We can set up applications for beef hooks and go after more application exploit levels. And then because we also have that wireless ability and we're bringing that wireless point, you, you can't bridge a wireless adapter. But if you put it in a monitor mode, we can bridge the AT0 interface with like our E0 interface, our WLAN interface that we have. You can't bridge WLAN, sorry. Our E0 interface that we have internet from and we can redirect it either through bridging and then run a VPN to that if we want or through packet forwarding and N4P knows how to set all those things up automatically based on the configuration structures that you set. Now if we're not going to run that way we can go a little bit further in our wireless attacks. We can crack WPS built in, we can crack WEP, WPA2, EIP Enterprise or the WPE which is the TKIP Enterprise those are used in the host APD. We can crack WPA2 through Airbase. And we can also choose to bring up that basic access point through using host APD if we rather prefer that, or Airbase if we prefer that. We have all the attacks at our disposal between that we can possibly do with host APD and Airbase. A lot of those attacks are already built into modules that I've given you. But I like to encourage anyone, if they have a different way of doing it, they have another module structure that they find usable. There is an example module packed in the software that you can use, look at, and just say, hey, I need to add a few variables. This is the code structure I need. And copy it into the, the modules folder of M4P. And now you have produced a new module for whatever engagement you found it useful. Then you can com contribute that to the community, and everyone else can start using that as well, which I think is what's really going to set things off and, and make it fun. The great thing about the structure of how the modules work are they are, they are not language dependent. N4P is written solely in Bash at the current moment, but you could write your module in C, Python, Perl, Bash, whichever you choose, as long as you follow the configuration structures and parse that information the, the, the same way that we are doing it, it'll work. So let's take a look at what we're going to see when we open up N4P initially, there's two modes. There's a basic mode and there's an advanced mode. And the basic mode is I have set up several options and abilities that you can just press one key and it goes ahead and completes the whole process without you having to do anything else. And there are the, the main things there, like um, ca capturing or sorry, doing recon scans of the network, finding the, finding the MAC addresses of the stations and the SIDs of the network are going to attack. 
then we can dump that in. We can use like air dump for that information for capturing the handshakes just by running option three in this case. And or if we change our attack vectors, you know, it would do, um, it could run wash and bully if we're trying to crack WPS. You know, those functions are, are right there. And I'll, I'll show you how you set that in N4P it differentiates between that. We can just go ahead and bring up a basic access point right here with hitting one button because the configuration file already knows like where we have our host APD config or what we're going to be setting up with Airbase. And then we have the firewall control. When we go through the configuration structures, the firewall browse, looks through your environment setups saying, what type of attacks am I doing? What type of interfaces are, am I using? And what am I going to be doing with them? And then allows the rules to be used just for those. It initially drops everything and then allows just those rules. So while you're performing these attacks, you're also securing your box behind a fully stateful firewall. You don't have to always hack naked now. Okay. We can deauth everyone right from here. We can start like SSL strip if we want at any time. We can start editor cap at any time, and we can ARP the network at any time. And all these functions are built a part of, or they utilize the adapters that we have predefined. And we'll move into that in just a little bit, but I just want to give you an overview of what the interface is going to look like when you initially start N4P and what to expect. N4P also uses a temporary file called temp N4P. So any type of information why we're doing a wireless hacking, capturing, um, doing cap files or capturing the handshakes or catching IVs on WEP web encryptions, it's going to save them in this log, log file based on the client's MAC address that you are attacking, as we see the MAC address dot cap. There's also recovered passwords and logs. If anything's going wrong, there's logging available. And there's also verbose logging available that UAU you can get more log information if you're debugging during this during the process that it will provide. All right. This is getting pretty complicated. As we can see, the project has evolved and it covers a lot of attack surfaces. And um, these attack surfaces, they really aren't simple. They do take a, a lot of experience and knowledge and, and fighting. So I tried to keep things real easy, but I didn't want to make it script kitty. I wanted you to still have to have an understanding of what you're doing. But because we've added so much functionality and capability, the configuration structure has gotten pretty intense. And I don't have a way of fixing that yet. So it's going to be hard to see from here. But this is our configuration file. And I'll try to give you an overview of what you're going to expect in this configuration file. I really need a laser pointer. All the way at the very top box that we have separated. I try to separate things in boxes. This is to designate what type of operating system we're going to be rerunning on. OS is Pen2. Right now, we're designed to work on Pen2 because we utilize the OpenRC in its system. Eventually, you know, there is some functionality that will work in Kali, so you need to change that option, as it will say, options available to Kali. And then it will know how to handle the interface structures through the init system. Network Manager manages network interfaces. Oh. You are a wonderful man. All right. Comfy mode. All right. If you're familiar with Network Manager, it can manage your adapters and interfaces in X environment. It's really good and it's really cool for the sense that it can manage keys. And if you have VPNs, it can handle the key structures for you. You don't have to type your 90 character password in there if you're as paranoid as me. 90 characters. In the interface that we're launching N4P in, as we said, there's basic and advanced mode. You can switch these at any time just by typing basic and advanced in the software, but we initially started as basic out of the, out of the box. If you're not using Network Manager, you can just set that to false. It's not needed, but sometimes I found that it picks up on wires cards that I couldn't get to initiate. It just picks up the module. 
but there is also a lot of issues it's caused and there's a ton of redundancy checks and loop checks in n4p that does everything it can to try to recover the system states when network manager borks it's about 95 percent foolproof then we have our wireless options this is considering if we're just going to run an access point for ourselves what type of options are we going to use for it and what are the base configurations for that and we can use host apd or airbase and we're defaulting to using airbase and our main interface right now i phase zero zero is eth zero this is our interface that we have like our internet connected to that way if we spin up an ap and we do the port forwarding for people to connect to and do the dhp assigning it will forward it through that interface. That's how the firewall tell, knows what interface to use. If you're using WLAN 1, you would change that to WLAN 1. All right, iPhase 1 is the next one. That's the interface we're using for our attacks. That is the main one we're concerned about when performing an attack. Now, if we're going to spoof anything, because we can control the, the ESID or the SSID uh, whichever you're more familiar with, the name of the access point that's coming up right there. We named it pen 21 If you just bring the access point up, that's fine. But if we're doing an evil, evil twin attack, we want to make that the name of the SSD of the access point that we are trying to impersonate. Um, this is the channel. That channel equals, you know, channel 1 through 11. Add the channel that you want to be on. That's also important for impersonating. And then there's monitoring modes. Monitoring modes, because we can custom monitor or monitor who's connecting to us. So if we're just launching an access point to see who's coming on or we're going to use SSL strip, if we have monitor mode enabled, there's an interface that will pop up and track the IP addresses of everyone who connects to, to your access point. This IP range is held in a DHCP file that's provided. And when we call DHCP, it calls that particular con file and get your DHCP leash range. If we want to cause bridging for our interfaces, if we're going to do multiple ethernets, like we have a switch and some USB ethernets, we plug them all together like we talked about. If we're doing some POC stuff on point of sales exchange, we can say that if we're going to bridge true uh, the name of the bridge, and if we're going to use a VPN in this process, all right? Um, Likely that should be false in those scenarios. Before we do anything in type of attack, we need to go through and familiarize yourself with what your type of your attack you're doing and how to understand the configuration file. We're not bridging, so we'll make sure that's false on your setup. Now let's get into like some really fun processes of hacking and attacking wireless networks. And this is where the fun comes in here. We can see our attack options are set for Null, which will bring an access point. Handshake attacks for WPA2, if we want to use Karma. If the attack's going to be using SSL strip, if we're going to do a WS attack, WPA attack, or EAP attack. So under attack, we just say what we're going to use. And this, when we launch the situations, it the environment or N4P knows what configurations need to be set and what flags can be called within Airbase or host APD as well as within the firewall based on what you choose. Now, if we're doing a handshake, which is one thing where we will be doing the panel, um, our attack for that is handshake attack is Z for WPA2. Um, right here is Z. And then the encryption type for that is for CCMP. So our encryption down here is going to equal four. So when we do our recon, it's going to tell you on the access point we choose what encryption is using. So we just need to adjust for the encryption we're using. And then we're going to copy in that victim's BSSID from our recon, as well as their station. That's going to allow us to hand do our WPA handshake. If we're on an enterprise network and we're going to hack a WPE or EAP, we have our configurations files down here for host APD. So we would just change our attack to WPE and would automatically use this location, which you need to adjust to whatever location you have your host APD file for WPAE attacks. Any questions so far? That's a lot of information.
Yes. There's no way to make that slide bigger, is there? No. <laughs> but but when you follow along and you launch the application, you'll definitely right. see it and it will make sense. Yeah, it is. I've, I've noticed that. My theme is pretty dark. This is. I wrote this theme. It's based on the movie Tron. It's on my GitHub. So if you like it outside of the slide, you can download it and use that theme to run the installer. We have packet options. This is what we talked about on a more lower level, on like OSI 2 model. And it's going to be using EtherCap. The options that we use at our cap are right here, the interface we're on, and you know, TK Zoo, Z we're choosing, and if we're going to ARP this network. And right now we're not ARPing the network, but if we were, we could add the IP address or the gateway of the target to get some ARP packets back. But if we had SSL strip running and we want to launch at our cap, it will do that and then automatically view off of that interface that we told it, and it will save it in the temp folder we talked about, recovered passwords. So that way you can retrieve some sniffed passwords. Getting more complicated. What do we do after? Could we really get more complicated? I know, yes. What can we do with these capture files and how do we retrieve passwords out of them if it wasn't through SSL strip? Maybe it was hashed or maybe it's a capture packet and it's AES. Really, there is no exploit vectors for wireless access when it's using WPA2. It's not a cracked or, or flawed uh, method of security, but it is vulnerable to guessing the password or brute force attacks. So I have two options built in. We can use AirCrack. AirCrack is what's originally set up, and it can just run off a dictionary, but there's no GPU support. It works really well for WEP if we captured IVs, and if our attacks WEP, it knows this on air, when AirCrack runs and sets it up just to crack some IVs and get a web key. But if we're using WPA, it's more complicated and it's just going to use a word list. And that word list is based right here. Word list equals share dick crack libs words. This is a dictionary that is predefined in Pentu, so you're going to be ready to go. And our test lab is set with you know a key for that. But that's not cool enough. We, we're trying to add some more you know, strange lead characters to my name. So I built in Hashcat. This was kind of hard. <laughs> the syntaxing for this is daunting. And anything wrong completely messes up. And there's log files go, hey, it just messed up. <laughs> Whew, thanks. Detailed logs. So Hashcat has several options, like OCL Hashcat 64, Hashcat 32, CLI, depending on you know what type of hardware we have. I have a preset up for OCL Hashcat 64 for using GPU cracking. Obviously, no one in here is probably going to have a GPU unless you're like crazy person gamer on your laptop in here. So it doesn't make as much sense for us to use this feature right now. So we're just going to be basing off the air crack. But anyways, as we set the Hashcat system we're going to use, we set the hashcat location because it's time bombed. It's a time bomb binary, and I can't rely on you just having it on your system. So you're going to know where you install it, and you're going to need to to know where that link location is. So here it's in the home, your user directory, OCL hashcat, and then you just call the binary. So just change the location to wherever you have dumped the binary install. Because we're focusing on WPA2 authentication here, our modes are going to be dash M2500. We're going to do this on three threads. And then we set the rule sets of what kind of rules are we going to be using based off of this word list. So I'm going to use rules RockU-3000 and also use the rules BEST64. You can change it to whatever you want. The cool thing about the way it's designed is you might not want to use that and you maybe you're hacking like a AT&T two-wire network, which an older <coughs> one, which you knew was 10-digit numerical only. You can just change the rule set based on what it tells you in here to use, hey, use this string here, word list, or word list equals you know, A3, question D, question D, based on the wildcard values, increment of up to 10, and start at sector 
choice. So that option is still in here. I'm not re restricting you from Hashcat. I was just trying to keep the functionality you need and can utilize in a concise manner that could benefit you the best I can. Uh, further down is just information about how you need to utilize this config file. Because uh, you can't just comment a line, but maybe I want to have three different rule sets I use a lot. I can just, as it says here, add a backslash or something right before the equal sign. That way I can have hashcat rules, backslash equals, a rule, again with a different rule, again with a different rule, and then just uncomment it with that backslash. That way I know what it's using the next time I run it uh, to make it the best I could. So all of these little blurbs should help walk you through the configuration file. And the bottom one just tells you how N4P is going to handle custom module variables modules for their variables. The module that is provided for you has a little feature in it if you read it saying create my custom module equals here and it will check if those variables are in this configuration file already. If they aren't, it'll go ahead and put them in for you the first run and tell you, hey, you need to go back and adjust the configuration files before this module works. That's mostly it for the config. It'll make a little more sense as you guys boot and you can see it. If you don't have a laptop and you want to see it, we'll do it over here as well on my system and, and help walk you through it. So now let's talk about the advanced features. It works a lot like Metasploit. So now that I went in advanced, I can actually run shell commands directly from here, any shell command I want, IP add or whatever, it can start coming up and you don't ever have to leave the interface. But I can run list modules. This tells me the list of modules that are pre-established or packaged right now with N4P, which is Airbase for bridging utilities, for cracking, if I want to bully, if I need to assign my DHCP. This allows you to handle individual processes. The key features up top are just saying, I know what I, need, I know what you need to have happen, so I'm just going to call these modules as they need it. It just goes with this module, then this module, then this module, and it makes the attack happen that you need. But if you're really cool and you're trying to do something more unique, you might need to have the ability to manually control this. So we're just going to be conf concerned with the recon module. So I'm just going to say use recon, and then it confirms that we're using the recon module at this point. If you typoed, it would, would tell you that you're confused. And when I want to run that module, I just type run. And that module will run. And at any time, I can also type show show options. And if you type, after you call it use recon, to use this module, you can show the options of that module, and it will show you a list of all the variables that that module is going to rely on for the config file. So you can go back to the config and know that you need to be concerned about these, these exact variables we can exit at any time with zero. As in this interface, we can see that we were using Network Manager during this time, so it knew that I needed to kill Network Manager to free my interfaces to run, but now that I'm leaving, I need to go ahead and bring that back up. And any interfaces that I changed, broke, had crazy configurations in the process, it remembers, and will go ahead and try to bring your system back to an original state, unbroken, just like it was before you even opened N4P. So where is N4P taking us, and how has this project changed the entire script land space of wireless hacking? The reason I think this has continued to change this landscape is we are now offering a module-based design. We are packaging all these attacks in, and you can rely on the community to say a cafe latte attack, anything random that someone's figured out. They can just publish for you. Now we're not just continually reading this help file and these man files and figure out why things are broken. We're doing a really good job of putting it together. And I think providing a framework that we have now going forward, it covers all of information security as we have it. We have MSF covering, you know, the application layer infrastructures and exploit vectors. We have set covering our social engineering projects. Where were we lacking? Now we have M4P continuing to close that gap and bring us in an environment where we can have wireless and lower level infrastructure exploitations available to us. And it's also worked really well for the reverse engineering process. So we're touching quite a few bases.
you know, and Rick has proposed, and it is an option for this year, that we want to evolve it even better. So we're probably going to like add some different languages, maybe the interface on Python to make it stronger, understanding list and dices more instead of cumbersome and bash, because it's getting a little hard to write in bash at this point. And we're also going to start you know, pulling code that Pony's written, some of the Pony Express code, revamping it, and Easy Cred's code. So the work that Easy Cred has done that is previously deprecated, we're going to start bringing in as modules and building an even bigger platform for you guys to move on for. So I think this will really help improve wireless and new framework for everybody. As it starts coming to Cali, it's going to bring more recognition, catch more traction. But the main focus is to hope to really enlighten and bring people to see Pentu because not many people know of Pentu or they think it's so much complicated because it's based on Gen 2. But Rick really has done a fabulous job of making Gen 2 work out of a box and give you penetration software. So we're going to utilize that and make sure it works as best as I can right now out of the ISO for you. Yes. Unbiased or biased? <laughs> uh, I started on Gen 2, um, and I was actually scared when I started, when I moved from a Debian-based system. Like, man, this is going to be really hard. You know what? It was pretty hard, but it had, a, it had such a good community. Like, everyone in the community was so brilliant that they would help, and the documentation was excellent. And about six months later, as we started getting the hang of it and understanding, and another year goes by, you know, the amount of control and aspects I have over my system now, it does what I want and only what I want. There's nothing interfering if every because everything's compiled if i don't want functionality i don't have to compile it in it re, it reduces attack vectors on my system based from that plus i get a hardened kernel out of the box so my system is much more manageable it's more secure in my opinion and it, all of the code is that is very rigorously gone through by rick and blsk vr that nothing comes in our package list that is not sane if we reviewed an application, even if it's in Cali, uh, the, something I think, I wasn't sure if it was Reaver or another one, the code just was not very sane. Like, this isn't done right. We're not putting in the project till it's sane. So we really make sure that what you're getting for a code based structure and attack works the best it can. The other really cool feature is that all the developers, the main developers for Pentu, are live in the IRC channel. So when you have issues you want to talk, they are right there directly helping. Say, hey, I found an e-build issue. It's not building Python use flags change. We need to set targets to use Python 2.7 and because our system's on 3.4. They will go ahead and fix it and move it on for you. So I, I think the community, the more we get involved, will really help out in that aspect. So that, that's my opinion on using it. I'm trying to get this to Cali user just because I want them to have the ability. I think this is great for everyone to use, but it, because I relied so much on infrastructure layer, it was hard to use system D. When they went to system D and were on open RC, it made it pretty difficult for me. But um, Rick says he's got some magic in his, in his hat that he hasn't told anybody about that we can really make this work. So that is the future of why I think it's going to be even great because we can make it cross-platform and independent. That'll really help out. Um, so that's it for slides. And I think we, it's time to play some games and hack some stuff. Is everyone ready to hack? Still downloading. Rick, your network sucks. I'm telling you. What I can do... I have the ability to show you a little bit and walk you th walk you through wireless downloading. And we're going to go ahead and I'm going to keep this AP up. So if you can't actually get things hacking while we're going at it right now, I'll be here and I'll go ahead and help you, you know, answer as it needs. Oh, thank you, brilliant person. All right, I'm actually running Network Manager at the moment, as we can see, our wireless information. So 
let's go ahead and take care of that. And we'll go ahead and look at my interfaces, what I have going on. I'm using WLAN 2, 1, and 0 as my main interfaces. As we can see, nothing has IPs, nothing's going anywhere. The interfaces are all down. So let's ask n 4 p what to do. All right, it knows I'm using Network Manager, so it killed everything that it needed that would interfere with our, with our application. And we can go ahead and, as foremost, understand the configuration file. All right, Network Manager is true, we're good. Um, our interface is still on basic. Our operating system is correct because I'm using Gen2. We're going to use host APD. Our attack interface is going to be WLAN2, that is correct. We're going to spin up the AP and 4P. Let's make it live. Here's the random BSID. We do channel one. It's all good. Verbose logs. Now, because we're just going to do an AP, our attack does need to be empty. So our attack is null at this point. And that pretty much means nothing else matters for this. So we can control X, Y, get out and save. All right, let's go ahead and bring up that AP. Oh no, yeah, yeah, we'll bring up that AP. Yeah. My phone is already set to connect. So we brought up that we brought up that AP. And I don't know if you guys can see I cannot make that font bigger. But hopefully highlighting helps. There's a victim pool that comes up because we have moderator enabled. So as it came up, we can see already that this victim has it logged on to our service after creating that access point. But we can go ahead and close. Close the access point. All right, so the access point's shut down now at this point. We want to do a little bit more. Oh yeah, that's why, because it was host APD. Let's do... So now let's do this with Airbase. Because Airbase is a little bit different, because we have to bring up monitoring interfaces, and we don't just have to launch host APD like we did. Host APD is very quick and easy, I think. So let's keep Airbase there. And we'll keep our attack still at nothing and see the difference what happens with Airbase. Airbase needs to initiate a monitoring interface. That's what it's just doing on the top left. And now we've just launched our Airbase with verbose logging. And we just got a victim associations over here. So anyone that wants to connect to this interface, N4P Live, you won't get anything. Why won't you get anything? Because I have not called DHCP. Yeah. So how can I call DHCP uh, from here? I can just go advance. Advanced. Okay, let me list our modules here. All right, good. So use HCP. All right. All right. And let's also do is there any options in this one? Oh, see, those are show options. So we can set our AP and our interface. Are the options required for this? Run it. Now our DHCP is ran.
try to connect again. The, um, the wireless in this room is highly congested. It is so congested. 2.4 does not like congested areas, just saying. You're right, it will. It's still trying to get an IP from this environment. <laughs> and for BeLive. We will probably at least see the client association coming up from over here. Because I'm getting probes from everybody. All right. There was the M4P Live client authentication there of where it's tried to authenticate. It's just not authenticating at the moment. It's okay. That's just a basic Airbase infrastructure. It's really hard to see off of this structure. Anyway, so I just killed it. And we see we just killed the interface. And at any time, if I check my IP, you can see that's already brought the interfaces back down and controlled them. It does, it finds, and it's hard to do that. So I want to go back through a little bit more, and I really wanted to try to do a handshake attack. So we do have airbase. We're going to go into... Um, that's fine for now. So we need to understand the reconnaissance. <coughs> All right, so now we're already reconning the environment. This is going to be really difficult with how busy this is. All right. All right, so if anyone's familiar, you're going to watch for the BSID and the SSID of who we want and try to match their station down here. And the one we're looking for is N4P hackable. Okay, there it is, um, but I don't have a station yet. I can't read it over here real quick. I can read it on my screen perfectly. All right. I just hit control C and paused it. That way I can go over here and read it and modify what I need. And they can figure out a configuration file for what we're doing here. We're not going to do an e we're not going to do an evil AP because you can because during this attack you can just bring up air dumb and try to capture it, or you can also run a, a evil twin AP where you can copy the BSID and that would be done here as well. So you make sure all of these features match, but in this case we don't. So it's just, it's just the attack. We have handshake for that attack that we want to do. Um, both of these are right, but we are going to be concerned about this.
instances are VSSID. Okay, who we're attacking? And the name of the name of who we're attacking is. Hopefully it works without the station because I couldn't let that run long enough to capture the, the station itself. So we're going to go with it like that. So now I'm prepared to do the attack. We can just run arrow dump right here by three. But if you were in an advanced, you could just use uh, dump like that. Oh, I'm confused. There we go. I can run it right from there. I want to go back. So we're going to try to stay in the easy mode and just run a dump. Boom. Our monitor interface has been brought up. And we're scanning and waiting for a handshake. Now, let's try to be a little more expeditious on capturing a handshake. How can we do that? We can just kick everyone off the network. I hope I had that. I hope I had the channel right. I don't remember if I had the channel right. But we can continue to keep kicking them. Oops, that was a firewall. Not needed. Seven kicks. Um, not capturing the handshake. Dump down and bring a recon down. So let's just try to recon one more time. <coughs> Normally, this would be a lot of work bringing up Airmon and Airbase each time back and forth. So, this is a lot of, believe it or not, time value to the situation. No, I had the channel right. Ooh, 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 I got the station. Yeah, that made me excited. <laughs> that time it loved me more. Unlike Rick. Seven A. Demo guys, please love me. <laughs> please. All right, we've already done a reconning, so we don't need a recon anymore. We set up the station, the channel, and the SSID to spoof before the dump, and we can go ahead and try and do it now. All right, we'll be mo oh, we already got the handshake right there. How about that? See, that was sexy, huh? Fastest handshake anyone's ever gotten. So now let's just go ahead and force this temp for us, N4P. 
And in our log file here, you can see we've already captured the handshake with this handshake, which is the MAC address that we just attacked based on this router here that we set up to be attacked. So great, we're here to go, we're ready to go. So we don't need to be out hanging out here anymore. We got it. We don't be hanging out here anymore either because we got what we came for. So let's think about cracking this wireless network. Um, option four, crack it. that says Sucks. Said it wasn't a valid handshake. So you might just have to go back and, and do it again to get that handshake. Oh, okay, never mind. I got it. See what happens now. There we go. And actually, it already says key found. So we basically just hacked the wireless access point in less than five minutes, and that's probably a new world record <laughs> for hacking wireless access point. What happened? Uh, I had previously had an the um, MAC address, a file in the temp folder with that existing MAC address. So when you do that, it, uh, it enumerates it to the next number up, 0, 01, 0, 02, 0, 03, as you capture more. And when I call it, it's only looking for 0, 01, and that was, was invalid. So I had to go back and remove 0, 01, rename it, and then it worked right away. That, that was our, our key feature. So that was WPA hacking. Do we have any questions on how to perform that or go through the config file a little bit. No, nope. Everyone's WPA2 hacking experts now. Yeah, yeah the way it's, the way Airbase names that is pretty confusing. Um, the ESSID would be which we normally see as the SID. Uh, but it's actually ESID, so that's just the name of it. Then the go back through. Um, okay, right. So yeah, our ESSID is just the name of the access point we are attacking or utilizing. The BSSID would be the MAC address to that device, and then the station is the address of what that particular access point is operating under. So if you were an enterprise network and they were spanned, you would see the same type of MAC addresses, but you would see a different station between different rooms. So if we wanted the access point that was just in this room and not the next one down, we would adjust our station to go through there. And there might not be clients on that. So when you're on a pen test in a bigger environment, you, you can walk around with like a spectrum analyzer, start seeing how much traffic is there. Or when you're just running, um, Airmon and, and viewing what's coming through there, you'll see how much traffic's on which one, and then you want to just wait to find that station. When you see the one with the highest traffic, highest station, that's the one you want to go to and utilize the attack that particular AP. Be much more likely to get a handshake right away, you know. And we did all that without a clientless handshake. We did that with a client handshake that wasn't clientless. 
the other option is at this same time, after we brought the air dump up, if we weren't catching anything, we can just also launch our access point at the same time. So that brings us up an evil twin, which people can also connect to. So not only were we likely to catch a handshake that way, we can now infiltrate, infiltrate their traffic structure that's coming through the network. So that can even be useful um, for, for many reasons that, you know, corporate environments. I didn't really want to, I'm not really gonna get into the enterprise because I don't have anything set up or we don't have a radius server set up for that structure. Thank you. Only five radius recon. All right, the other thing we just want to understand, and I'll probably show you some of the rule structures here on enumerating the firewall. If I've brought that access point up just as a basic access point, our firewall is going to need to understand how we're going to um, utilize that. And I'll show you how it uses that. If you're, if you're waiting and waiting on it, um, there might not be anyone on the network if you're not getting it. And then you can't kick them. Um, one thing you can try is a lot stronger antenna because maybe someone's further in a building that does have authentication. And if you appear stronger, they'll want to connect to you. Um, you can use I IW config and adjust the tux pow power, excuse me, if you change the region to like uh, uh, bump the power up to like 30. That way it's exponentially stronger than what the standard uh, wireless controller is going to give out, making your clients more susceptible to connecting to you. So it's just about making yourself feel more appealing to the environment that, that we're working on here. Um, recon wash. Let me have a screen. Firewall example. Dump. All right. Let me just go ahead and try and show you the firewall. I purposely used a white background. The initiation process is it starts to understand everything that we're using, what interfaces we're using, the access points, the bridges. If we're using VPNs, you know, it starts by dumping the tables and flushing the in system. Um, we just allow our forwarding and we set our default policies for, for the chains that we're going to utilize. If we have a VPN enabled, it's going to change the rules. If there's no VPN set, it's not going to. Um, just some basic traffic dates for the DHCP server, for the DNS servers, if you're running all of that locally. Uh, if you're running Samba, maybe somebody connects to the network and you want to run an NTLM and our listener to get their information. Like if you know someone travels a corporate network, you can get them to connect and run run NTL on the listener, you're going to want these ports open. So those are there. If you bridge the interface or if you don't bridge the interface and you need port forwarding, it controls the rules differently. So if we're using an access point like Airbase, it knows that and it's going to allow the post routing masquerading and accept the package through. But what's allowed down here where it's commented, if you go in here, if you're doing a lot of reverse engineering on applications, say you have a Windows box, you're reverse engineering web, web authentication of the software to crack, you can go here and uncomment these lines com and then comment these lines up. And then you can control the, only the ports that you want to have access through your AP. That way it really reduces the noise in your traffic while you're running Wireshark to capture how the web authentication is working for cracking that piece of software. So that's some more control that you're getting inside when we talk about the infrastructure layer. And this is just if you're using host APD, it allows the rules differently. And then we have a lot of incognito things if we're going to allow ICMP or not or port scans. That way, if we're doing vulnerability research on a network, we want to stay incognito. These situations will keep us invisible to the network and not allow any traffic to leave until you designate it based on an interface that can only go out and can't receive. So those are some of the strengths that we're that we're receiving 
with inside the firewall controls. That would really just be if an application itself is vulnerable to it, to a buffer overflow on a hardened kernel, because Gen2 is compiled. If you're compiling it with checks in different canaries in, in the memory structure, where a buffer overflow wouldn't happen to the system if it was vulnerable. So that's just why hardens a little bit more secure. I don't know if anyone's gotten it downloaded yet or not. Yeah. So that, uh, can everyone, is that just like a global deauth this ID or is it like a round robin? It, it is a single global deauth. Um, and then if you didn't get a handshake, wait a second, you do it again. Just keep going ahead, ahead and doing it as, as you want. Uh, Who will? That who kicked you off? What? Well, that would be pretty weird because you're just flooding the beacons of that, and they're not really able to block. You're still flooding it. If it just theoretically, if that happened. I mean, I'm not the end-all, be-all in everything wireless. Try changing your identity, like your MAC address of your device, and do it again. Because obviously we can set it here. So just change it while you're doing the deauth, and you know you should be back running. Anything else that anyone would like to cover? I know it's a really in-depth application to kind of understand. I've only kind of touched the surface of actual attacking. Yes, I will absolutely go ahead and keep this AP running for you. That way you can have practice. I'm going to be around. So when everyone does get things set up, I was trying to do it while we're in the panel that way people can follow along and actually get some handshakes together. <laughs> I'll be happy to help anyone there and push you through the software, understand how to get it, and crack some WPA if you haven't done it before. You're going to need to use the Pen2 VM right now because it's the only way you can get the software. Uh, when you update it, as I said in the initial uh, in the initial slides, Uh, I should probably bring this back up. <laughs> All right, there we go. So how I set a timer? How do you do that? That's fine. I can just leave it up like this. I'll just leave it like that. I don't know what the heck it's doing at this point. Yes, all of that will be available all day while you're here for the rest of the con. You can download it off of where the red instructions are and try it. And I will leave this AP up. And it's N4P hackable is the, is the name. The password to the dictionary is in the pen to already in our dictionary folder. So that's part of the reason. I just made sure that you know the dictionary file that you're going to be tackling with would have a valid crackable key. Um, but we're almost out of time. Who's ever a lovely person that gave me this pen? Thank you. Much appreciated. All right.
Well, we have a few minutes, and I, I thank you guys so very much for coming to the panel, and I hope you learned something, want to be involved in the community, or follow the project from here on out, because I'm kind of tired of being the only developer. <laughs> Let me rephrase, the only developer. We're done. <coughs> yeah. Not everyone's gotten to download it in time. So I kind of had to breeze through it on my own. Yeah. yeah. It is what it is. It's Rick's fault. Yes. <laughs> um, I, I had IP6 running, well, I, I have to say, it, it doesn't really affect it too much. What happened is I had IP6 running on one of my routers, and I was having a really hard time with things just being flaky. Um, so I think it was, it's just going to have me take some research and understand how to handle IP version 6 within this attack vector. Yeah. But, I mean, it will come. It will come. All right now i got to finish implementing the EAP technology. Um, you can do it now if you know how to configure the host APD compile. Just make a couple adjustments and then start a radius server on the back end. But to make it more usable, I'll add the radius server as a dependency in the eBuild package. Um, when we install packages on Gento, we use eBuilds. And because it's compiled by source, we can associate dependencies with applications and configuration files. So in the next update, when that's available, I can require that if, if you choose to use Tellit use EAP technology for hacking, then go ahead and associate Radius. So that, that way the Radius server will, server will install, and then I can package a comp file for that already with you. Sure, if you want to, if you have a good site that you know of that you want to parse, um, yeah, and you have online activity, this does kill your interfaces constantly. It makes it difficult. So if you kill your, I knew I need it like that. So what you can do around that is you can run a wired interface. Just launch your DHCP server in Oven or ETH, ETH zero or ETH one. Then you'll have an internet connection on your base. And N4P is only at that point going to kill your wireless structure and utilize it. So if you want to have a module that says upload hashes that parses this, this site, it can take it from the temp folder, send it up, and automatically parse and pull it down. So that could be a module that could very easily be implemented. <laughs> App and hash in. Yeah, what, one of the good things that happens while we're using um, a Hashcat in here, as we saw the cap file, that doesn't work with Hashcat, it has to be converted. So it does that conversion already for you and removes all the junk behind you and starts the Hashcat going. So it's a lot of work to do that on your own. If you've ever used all that stuff, it's hard. <laughs> if you can use one button to me to get things done, I'm like, in, out, you're hacked, see ya. <laughs> like, who else gets hacked that quick? Nobody. I actually just hacked AC. Uh, this is my N. I have an AC over here, and I was using the AC interface to do that. Now, I know this is the car to go to. I find I found it since I used the AC one. This is much flakier. I've had a lot more. I've had a lot more issues with the modules. You know, the, the car dropping the driver of the interface, it would just disappear and bringing it up, or it would get hung. It would get hung in PIDs. So I had to add a lot of extra redundancy checks in N4P right now as when it rebuilds a network or it tries to launch a new monitor interface. If it's not doing it, it throws it in a loop. And then if it does, resets like network manager, the modules can come back on, it resets for the PID. There's the PID there, it kills the PID and loops back through. Uh, Basically, if you just uh, call ps-a and you get a list of all the PIDs, you can grep that for the applications I'm using, like Airbase. And if I see Airbase come up as a positive, then I know that the PID's locked, and I can just parse out the PID number and kill it, and then go back into the loop. 
It's just forcing a way to kill it down. Yeah, that's what I did. I immediately started using it to finish this coding after I got it and ended up finding that it was... It's been the best card that I've used so far, so I recommend it. Um, yep, very welcome. It's about our 10 minutes that we had to goof off. But thank you very much, guys, for coming to the panel. Yeah.